Newfoundland. People with courage and foresight have come to mine this rich land for hundreds of years. Now, the next chapter in Newfoundland's mining history is being written. To learn more, find us online at newfoundgold.ca. Welcome back to Palisade Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix, and joining me today is Nick Barashev. He's the president and CEO of BMG Group. He's been focused on the precious metal space for the last 20 years, and he's also the author of $10,000 Gold. How are you today, Nick? I'm great, and thank you for inviting me on your show. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to have you. Maybe we could start by if you could tell us a little bit about the BMG Bullion Fund, how you store the bullion, how you back it, and the considerations that you have around storing and purchasing equal amounts of bullion for every dollar invested into the fund. Right. So I started this in 1998, and it took four years to get all the approvals from the Ontario Securities Commission, and then another year for the other provinces, including Alberta. And the reason was that I wanted to create an up precious metals product that qualified for the retirement accounts and registered accounts without compromising any of the attributes of bullion. So that required setting up an open end mutual fund trust so that the purchases and redemptions were coming in and out of the bullion markets themselves. So that would be the liquidity. Whereas if you do a closed end fund or an ETF or most other products like that, the liquidity is based on the trading volume per day. But the bullion markets you know, are in excess of 50 billion in bullion trading a day. So that's the liquidity of bullion. And I wanted to maintain that. The other aspects is that I, I wanted it to be structured so that there was no interference in the bullion, so that there is no hedging, leasing, rebalancing, any of those things that the investor and or his advisor decides when to buy and when to sell, and we just make sure it happens. Now, the critical aspect of it was also to ensure that the fund got clear title to the bullion and actually owned it, and neither we nor the custodian could lease it out or hypothecate it or do anything. So we went to a great deal of trouble in ensuring that the process is done properly and then it, that it's stored on a fully allocated insured basis. So that was key to the concept that it would be as close to owning physical bullion as you could make it, but still qualify for registered retirement accounts. So are there any particular minimums or, or any considerations like that when investing in the fund? Well, the minimums are $1,000. And so it's something that's affordable by almost anybody. And since we did the first fund, which was a tri-metal fund, because at the time, one of the exemptions was that normally mutual funds aren't allowed to hold more than 10% in any one asset class. And by holding three, we would be holding 33% in each metal. So that was one of the exemptions we got. A number of years later, we were able to apply and push the, the thing further where we created a gold only fund and then a silver only fund. So now we have three funds, the tri-metal fund, the gold fund, and then the silver fund. So the tri-metal fund includes platinum, correct? That's right. And the reason I chose those three metals, because those are the three metals that have had monetary uses throughout history. Like, for instance, it's not that well known, but platinum was used for money in Russia for 300 years. But for example, palladium has never been used as a monetary asset. So that's why I kept it to the three precious metals didn't get into any of the exotic precious metals in the commodities and so on. So Nick, how much do you think investors should allocate to bullion in their portfolios? Well, we've done studies about this and you know, if we look at a traditional 60-40 bond portfolio in normal times, then somewhere between 10 to 20 percent will improve portfolio returns and reduce risk. But now my kind of philosophy has changed because there's so many risks, so much chaos, that that's not you know the recommendation today. On my own personal portfolio, what I have as a philosophy is that I understand that the bullion is actual money. So I have 100% of my money in gold and silver. And the only time I would take it out of the vault in order to invest it in, to deploy it into other assets like real estate equities or bonds, if I could get 
more ounces back than I put in. For most investments, that wouldn't have worked. Like gold has averaged 10% a year for the last 20 years in most major currencies. A lot, a lot of investment portfolios have been well below, which means that if you took gold out of the vault and bought other assets with it, you'd be getting less gold back today. And if you look at the top performers like Ray Dalio and Warren Buffett, recently their flagship funds have lost significant amounts of money and gold dramatically outperformed them. So as a typical investor, you're not going to be doing as well as Buffett and Dalio and you know, gold's going to outperform you. So it's kind of a different philosophy today with the risk and chaos that we're faced with than it has been under normal conditions. So, Nick, as we're speaking about risk, it makes me wonder what the considerations for risk are when storing bullion in Canada. We've all heard the stories about gold being made illegal to own in the 30s in the States, and we kind of discussed that a little bit before the call. So what are some of those considerations? Well, the issue is you can never be 100 percent sure of of what the government will do to it. So there are various things. Uh, The big misconception has been that gold was confiscated in the U.S. in 1933, but it wasn't really confiscated, it was expropriated. They paid you the market value for gold at the time. And then when they collected all the gold from the citizens, then they devalued the dollar 50%, which made the gold twice as valuable. And then they created additional laws, which made it illegal for U.S. citizens to own gold anywhere in the world. And that stayed in place till 1974. And of course, in 1971, when countries could exchange dollars for gold, that was eliminated and the dollar became free floating. So they can do any of the above. The issue is confiscation would be extremely difficult to enforce, but they still could pay you the market price. Like, let's say for ease of arithmetic, today's price was 2000. They would pay you 2000 and gold goes up to 10,000 you would miss out on all of that. So that's quite possible, but that's not likely to happen at a point until the gold price is much higher. The other risk is the governments can always pass a law that's like excess profits tax on gold in the future. So that's one risk. One way to mitigate the risk is to hold part of the portfolio in silver and platinum because government interventions have never happened in those two metals because their commodity use is so prolific, it would be extremely hard to enforce. So that's one of the methods. Storing the gold offshore is one possibility, but like I say, in the States in 1933, they made it illegal to hold gold anywhere. So you could get caught by that. So the government intervention always is a risk, no matter what. Now, one mitigating factor over 1933 and today was now there isn't a single currency in the world that's backed by gold. So to do any of this would be sort of acknowledging that gold is real money and you need it to back the currencies, which would be a major shift. So those things all could happen, but I think there's someone in the future. And the other position that would be kind of ludicrous where China is recommending that its citizens buy and hold gold and they're accumulating gold, you know, in terms of all their production stays in China. Same thing's happening in Russia. So to have those two communist countries allow their citizens to own gold in the Western not would be a somewhat of a of a perception problem. So Nick, could you tell us if there's any types of bullion that are better to be purchasing at this time, whether it would be coins or bars, collectibles, junk, anything like that? Well, the collectibles are, you know, depending on how rare a collectible you get, but they they often can become difficult to liquidate. You you pay a big premium to buy them, and then if you have to sell them at the appropriate time, you're not going to recoup your premium. So that collectibles are in in a different category. You know, whether it's bullion or coins depends on your level of wealth. Most people can't really afford to buy bullion, like one 400 ounce bullion bar is like close to a million dollars. So only the ultra high net worth investors can do that. And the coins have a much bigger premium than, you know, bullion coins will have a much bigger premium than bullion bars because of the cost of manufacturing and so on. 
So it depends on your level of wealth. For high net worth investors, apart from our funds, we also sell individual bullion bars that are held in allocated storage in Brinks. So those investors are primarily buying bars. In the funds, we buy the biggest bars possible to keep the cost down. So it's really an an investor situation. If you're a smaller investor, then you're basically forced to buy coins in smaller denominations or buy a mutual fund and you can invest $1,000 at a time. So that's kind of the thing. When you break it down between the metals, usually the gold price is the one that goes up first, which it has been. Silver has been lagging in the gold to silver ratio, although it's come down is still disproportionately high. And platinum, which typically trades above the gold price, is below the gold price. So at some point in time, both platinum and silver have to normalize to their mean to just catch up to where they should be relative to gold. But you know, gold will be rising pretty much in proportion to the amount of money that central banks of the world are printing. Nick, I'd like to turn to your book that you wrote in 2013, and you titled it $10,000 Gold. So considering your perspective of where we are today and the crazy market environment, as you were saying, would you want to update that price target? Well, if I did, it would probably be forty or $50,000 gold. <laughs> you know, so see, the $10,000 gold was based on the correlation of the gold price to U.S. debt. So it's been relatively closely correlated up until 2011. Then it diverged. So right now, to come back to that normalized price like today, it would be well over $2,000. And that's just to normalize it for historical norms. But now with COVID, the U.S. Federal Reserve has been printing an amount of money that no one could imagine before. And it's going to grow dramatically because right now the money was used to pay people not to work. But at some point, they're going to have to print money to get the economy going again. And that's a much larger amount. So what we've seen so far is just the tip of the iceberg. And as you're saying that we're just kind of seeing the tip of the iceberg, you have a background in real estate, and that gives you an interesting perspective into something we were talking about before the call, that you see a commercial real estate crash coming, and that could really start to kick things off downhill for the economy in the broader market here, right? Well, that's right, because some of the major sectors, like if you take the hotel sector, some of the hotels are owned by pension funds, so they'll typically won't have any debt associated with them. But a lot of the smaller hotels are owned by individual investors and, and in some cases REITs, and they would have a considerable amount of debt. Now, the hotel occupancy rates, I don't remember them ever being this low that we've had, and people just aren't going to hotels, there's no conventions, you know, weddings and different parties aren't allowed to happen, you know, annual shareholders meetings, all those kind of things aren't happening at hotels. So the ones that are privately owned by landlords are looking to default on their mortgages because they can only sustain this for so long. So as the landlords get into trouble, they default on the mortgages. And then when enough of that happens, then the banks and the various institutions that finance them are in trouble. And that same kind of phenomenon exists in retail commercial. Now, most of the really big shopping centers are owned by pension funds, but the strip malls and smaller centers are owned by private investors and have mortgages. And they're already got vacancy rates that means they're well below break even in terms of their being able to service their mortgage debt. And as this continues, there'll be more and more small businesses that aren't going to be able to hold on much longer. So as we enter the fall, we're going to have more bankruptcies, more real estate defaults, followed by landlord defaults, followed by problems in the bank. So it's just like a cascading spiral that hasn't yet begun. Office space, the same thing. A lot of the big employers, if the employees are doing administrative or computer work, they're having them work at home. But at the same time, the offices aren't configured properly for social distancing. So even if they're going to recall their employees, they have to reconfigure the offices. 
many of the landlords aren't going to spend the money reconfiguring offices. They're going to leave the employees working at home. So the office sector is going to be a big bloodbath as well. And then when you look in terms of residential, you know, whether it's New York City or Toronto or Calgary, a lot of people are moving out of the major centers and moving into the country or whatever. If, if you're allowed to work at home, you might as well live at the cottage. So that's the trend. So the downtown condos are getting difficult to sell from a demand point of view. And country properties are going up and demand is going up for country properties. So there's a big upheaval in the real estate sector coming. And that for sure could trigger a major crash in the equity markets. And one of the terms that you had brought up when it concerns the mortgages is force majeure. So could you explain a little bit about what that means and what that, not necessarily loophole, but that definition in each contract would represent? Right. And and like every commercial real estate lease agreement I've ever seen that has a force majeure clause that says essentially if there's riots, civil insurrection, natural disasters, the lease can be terminated or suspended. Now, the other thing that's included in first majeure is government edict. So this is crystal clear that the government made it illegal to use office space from March to almost June, and many people were still forced to pay rent. But there's going to be lawsuits and everything else because that clause could very well prevent the landlord from suing and in some cases may negate the lease entirely. So there's going to be plenty of lawsuits on that basis as tenants want to get out of their leases. Force majeure is also something we've had come up recently on the show as we've had kind of a debate about if the COMEX is basically able to deliver the contracts of gold and silver that are standing for delivery or not. And I was wondering if you could weigh in a little bit on your opinion on if the COMEX is going to be able to actually bring this gold and silver to the people that are standing for delivery. Right. Well, normally on the COMEX, 90% of the futures contracts settle in cash and people don't typically ask for delivery. But over the last three, four months, a greater and greater percentage have been standing for delivery. And when you look at the ratio of paper contracts to physical bullion that the COMEX warehouses have, they can't possibly deliver what's required. So it seems toward the end of every COMEX expiry date, the prices for the metals are knocked down, which then minimizes the number of people standing for delivery. But sooner or later, they're not going to be able to make anywhere close. But the COMEX has always had the ability to change the rules. So they could simply pass a rule that says, sorry, but you have to settle in cash or sorry, we're doubling or tripling the margin requirements. That's what they did in the 70s to the Hunt brothers. Absolutely. And that's a very interesting story in and of itself. Nick, I'd like to turn a little bit to China. And you had some interesting thoughts on what could happen when China announces that they actually do hold more physical gold than the U.S. and what could happen to the dollar because of that. Well, the thing is not a conspiracy theory. The Chinese finance minister has previously announced that their intention is to have more gold than the U.S., So the U.S. purportedly has 8,000 tons, which a lot of people have questioned because there hasn't been an audit done since the 1950s. But let's assume they do have 8,000 tons. China buys its gold through the Sovereign Wealth Fund and is currently the number one gold producer in the world. But any of the gold that's produced by China is kept in China, doesn't go outside of China. So it doesn't enter the gold market. Same thing happens for Russia. And Russia, I think, is the number two or three gold producer. They're keeping all their gold. But what China does is they buy the gold in the sovereign wealth fund. And that doesn't report anything to anybody. And the central bank purportedly only has 1,600 tons. Now, many people think that China already has well in excess of 6,000 tons in the sovereign wealth fund. And China really isn't going to make an announcement that they have more gold to the U.S. until they feel the time is right, because right now the price of gold is suppressed and it's a good deal for them. They're buying at a discount, so they have no motivation to have the gold price go up. But at some point when they announce that, let's say, OK, well, now we're satisfied and we have 10,000 tons, the question is going to become, well, where did they get to 10,000 tons? 
because the two major reporting services, GFMS and CPM, have accounted for the supply and demand of all the gold in the world. And you don't have a missing 10,000 tons coming from anywhere. The only place it can come from is leased gold that is being shipped to uh, Switzerland, reconverted into one kilo bars and then sent to China. But that means that ultimately the leases are going to default and that's where the problem of auditing the Fed. So the problem of China announcing that it's got 10,000 tons is going to be that the U.S. doesn't have 8,000 tons after all. And that's what's going to be devastating for the dollar. And is that simply because China will basically take over as a reserve currency? Well, that's also their stated intent. But even if it's simply like right now, China has about a 10% position in the SDRs and the U.S. has over 40%. So China's goal is if we're going to go to SDRs as a reserve currency, that they have the dominant position. And in that position depends on how much gold you have. Interesting, Nick. You also had a uh, very interesting strategy that you were somewhat suggesting to gold and silver miners, where they keep the majority of the gold that they're mining and sell off basically just enough to be able to cover their operating expenses. Can you tell us a little bit more about why they would want to do that just to expand their balance sheet and when they might actually sell that excess that they're saving? Well, you see, then, of all of them, there's only a few mining companies, CEOs that understand that what they're mining is real money and it's in competition with Federal Reserve paper money. Most of the miners think it's a commodity, no different than copper, or zinc, or nickel. So, you know, they go into the jungle, do their exploration, find a site, fly back to Vancouver, raise some money, buy some equipment, dig the stuff up and sell it. Why would you want to sell real money in exchange for paper dollars? But that's where they, the majority of them don't understand that process and don't understand the difference for gold and silver as opposed to nickel or lead. Mm -hmm. That's what you do with nickel and lead. You don't do that with gold or silver. Perfect, Nick. Is there anything else that you'd like to wrap up before we end the show here? Well, I think we've covered quite a bit for people to absorb in one sitting, so I hope it clarifies stuff. But basically, I think people need to hunker down. The equity markets have been moving totally on momentum, and because of the amount of money printing, you know, we haven't had traditional monetary inflation. Although people like John Williams of Shadow Stats think that current inflation is about eight or nine percent if we use the old methodology for calculating inflation. But the inflation is, you know, largely manipulated. So most investments are underperforming inflation. So that's the other consideration. But as the money printing takes hold, then you're going to get inflation in terms of consumer inflation rather than simply inflation in equity prices. Absolutely. And it seems to be that this is hopefully the right place to be to really combat that inflation, right? Exactly. Yeah. Excellent, Nick. Where's the best place to find more information about you? Well, we have our website is bmg-group.com. And on there, we have several different sites. We have the site for the mutual funds, the site for the physical bullion program, and then a do-it-yourself investor site for those investors that manage their own investments. Excellent, Nick. Well, thanks very much for your time today. You're welcome. My pleasure. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website. Think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people? Hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip-your-face-off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?